everybody. My name is David Guzik, and I'm very pleased that you could join me today for our Thursday afternoon YouTube live question and answer program. I want to give a special greeting, and I'll do this several times throughout our time, to our TWR360 viewers. Uh, we're very grateful for the partnership that we have with uh, putting out this question and answer program on the TWR360 platform. TWR stands for Trans World Radio, which for many, many decades has been an outstanding ministry, getting the gospel of Jesus Christ all over the world, uh, mainly in the beginning through the medium of shortwave radio, but now, of course, through an increasing web and online presence. It's wonderful to see how God has used that. So again, I just want to say welcome and thank you to our friends at TWR360. How we usually do it here on a uh, Thursday afternoon, and I say Thursday afternoon because that's what time it is here in Southern California, uh, where I'm speaking to you from my home. Uh, we get together at 12 noon Pacific time. I don't know what time in the world it is at your particular place. One of the things we really enjoy about these uh, Thursday afternoons is that we do have an international audience, and I'm very pleased that we can reach out to people all over the world and that they can be here with us to, uh, you know, just be a part of things here. So again, welcome. We're very, very glad that you can be with us here. Okay, our lead question for today comes from Urduha. I, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Please forgive me if I'm not. But this is a question that came in some time ago, I believe by email. And basically, I could boil the question down to a single phrase. This question, was Judas a hero? Now, here's the question I'll give it to you in its entirety from Urdua asks, uh, Jesus Christ suffered and died to pay the penalty of our sins so that those who believe in him will not perish in hell, but have eternal life in heaven. If Judas Iscariot did not betray Jesus, then Jesus would not have suffered and died. So is Jesus, is Judas, I should say, actually a hero for Christians? Well, Urduha, I thank you for asking this question. I think it's a excellent question to ask, and people have asked this question to me before. And really what you're dealing with here is the idea that we know that as believers, Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world, and it wasn't primarily through his sinless life that he accomplished our salvation— not primarily through his uh, amazing teaching that he accomplished our salvation. It wasn't primarily through the miraculous things that he did. Of course, all of those elements play into his uh, complete role as a savior for us. But fundamental salvation was the sacrificial, substitutional death of Jesus Christ on the cross and then his subsequent uh, resurrection, his raising from the dead, to demonstrate that the price was paid at the cross and that he was not bound by sin or death. Okay, so we understand that it's Jesus' work on the cross. And people have asked the same question that Urduhu asked, Urdua, I should say, asked. If Judas is in some way responsible for Jesus going to the cross, then maybe Judas did a good thing in betraying Jesus, and that we shouldn't think of him negatively. You know, this brings to my mind what many people talk about in wanting to suggest the motives that Judas had in betraying Jesus. Through the centuries, many different suggestions have been offered regarding the motive that G Judas had in betraying Jesus. For example, Matthew chapter 10, verse 4, calls him Judas Iscariot. That's not the only verse, but that's one verse in the Gospels. Judas Iscariot. Now, it may be that that means that he was from the village or city of Kerioth. That's a city in southern Judah. Again, we can't be certain. There may be other associations with that name, Iscariot. But if he was from Kerioth, that would make Judas probably the only Judean among the other disciples. The rest of them were all from the area of Galilee. Now, some people wonder if Judas resented the leadership of Galilean fishermen among the disciples, and maybe he had finally had enough. That's one suggestion. Other people suggest this, that Judas was disillusioned 
with the type of Messiah that Jesus revealed himself to be. In other words, Judas wanted Jesus to be a more political Messiah, a more conquering Messiah. And that's not what Jesus came to do in his first coming. Some people suggest, this is number three, that Judas watched the ongoing conflict between Jesus and the religious leaders. And as he watched that, Judas concluded that the religious leaders were winning and Jesus was losing. Therefore, Judas perhaps decided to cut his losses and join the winning side. Perhaps Judas came to the conclusion that Jesus was simply not the Messiah or that he wasn't a true prophet, uh, even as Saul of Tarsus uh, first believed, later on we know from the book of Acts, before his conversion. And there are even some people who suggest that Judas betrayed Jesus from a noble motive, that it was something like this, that Judas actually believed that Jesus was the Messiah. He was impatient for Jesus to reveal himself as a powerful Messiah. And so he thought that doing this would sort of force Jesus to reveal himself in power this way. Well, again, all those, I think I listed six different things that people suggest as a possible motive for why Judas betrayed Jesus. I want you to know that there may have been elements of any one of those six things, but that's not the fundamental reason from the Bible that we know Judas betrayed Jesus. There is a fundamental motive described in the Bible for uh, the reason why Judas betrayed Jesus. Now, before I get to that, let's understand that Jesus knew that Judas would betray him. We know this from John chapter 6, verses 70 and 71, where it says, Jesus answered them, Did I not choose you, the twelve, and one of you as a devil? He spoke of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for it was he who would betray him, being one of the twelve. So you see there, we know that Jesus knew that Judas would betray him and long before. Now, this means that Jesus chose Judas and it was no mistake that he chose him. Je Jesus did not choose Judas because he didn't know how he would turn out. Matter of fact, Jesus told his disciples, as we just said, that he chose them and he knew that one of them was a devil. It's not like Jesus run, had run out of applicants for people to be his disciples. Jesus wasn't looking to have sort of a scandalous bad boy among his 12. No, no. Matter of fact, we know of no scandal, at least publicly known, surrounding Judas during Jesus's ministry. Now, I would suggest to you that the other disciples did far more stupid things during their three years than Jesus, than Judas obviously did. Okay, then... What is it about Judas? Well, let me tell you something. One more thing before I get to the specific motive that is revealed to us in the scriptures. We do know this, that it was revealed that Judas was a thief. Look at John chapter 12, verses 4, 5, and 6. It says, Then one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, Why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box and he used to take what was put in it. Now, again, I want you to think about those words. He used to take what was put in it. Those words there at the very end of verse six. The, the idea there in the original grammar is that this was something that Judas continually did. He was a thief and he made a practice of secretly stealing the money from the disciples. And this leads us to the true motive of Judas. Friends, I'm telling you, we don't have to guess at the motives. Now, look, people do things, especially greatly consequential things. Sometimes they do them from more than one motive. So I'm not suggesting that this is necessarily the only motive that Judas had. But because it is the only one that the Bible tells us of, we can say that this was the main motive that Judas had. What was it? Friends, it was simply this. The motive of Judas was greed. Look at Matthew chapter 26, verses 14, 15, and 16, where we read, Then one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, 
went to the chief priests and said, what are you willing to give me if I deliver him to you? And they counted out to him 30 pieces of silver. So from that time, he sought opportunity to betray him. Friends, do you realize that? The motive of Judas was greed. Did you see the question that he asked the religious leaders? I'll put it up one more time for you. What are you willing to give me if I deliver him to you? Friends, that's the kind of thing that you say in bargaining, in negotiation. When you're trying to negotiate a price, Judas was willing to betray Jesus if the price was right. That tells us his motivation was greed. There was nothing noble in Judas's motivation. It was motivated out of greed. Now, I just want you to pause and think about that for a moment. Judas fundamentally did what he did because he was a greedy man and he loved money more than his Lord. Friends, this is something that we need to watch out for. Because in general, and I know I'm speaking to a wide audience and I don't know everybody's particular situation, but in general, we live in a very prosperous age. We have things and technology and comforts and privileges in our life that would be unheard of a hundred years ago, much less a thousand years ago, much less two thousand years ago in Bible times. It's very easy for us to love money and materialism. That was the motive of Jesus. Don't get away from those words that he said. What are you willing to give me if I deliver him to you? That's what Judas said to the religious leaders. Now, I think it's fascinating that Jesus actually gave Judas one last chance to repent. We know this from the account of Matthew and the accounts uh, in the other Gospels, that there at the Last Supper, Jesus very deliberately gave Judas a last chance to repent, but he didn't take it. And we also know that the devil inspired Judas to do what he did, and he actually possessed Judas. Look at these words from the Gospel of John. John chapter 13, verse 2 says, And supper being ended... The devil having already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's sons, to betray him. So, it was Judas's greed that was provoked and amplified by the working of Satan tempting him. And then if you go down to verses 26 and 27 of John chapter 13, they're up on the screen there for you now. It says, Jesus answered it is he to whom I shall give a piece of bread when I have dipped it. And having dipped the bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. Now, after the piece of bread, Satan entered him. Then Jesus said to him, what you do, do quickly. Did you see those words in John chapter 13? Satan actually entered in to Judas. He was not only demon-possessed, he was possessed by Satan himself. I, I want to amplify Judas's sin if I could even more here. Judas actually led the soldiers that came to arrest Jesus. Look at John chapter 18, verse 3. It says this, Then Judas, having received a detachment of troops and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, came there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Did you see the phrasing there of John there in verse 18? He received a detachment of troops. So th there's some sense, I mean, not in every imaginable, but there's some sense Judas was leading or commanding this. He was the head of the operation. And then you know what happened next. Judas betrayed Jesus. And how did he betray him? He betrayed him with a kiss. Matthew chapter 26, starting at verse 48 says, now his betrayer had given him a sign saying, whomever I kiss, he is the one, sees him, immediately went up to Jesus and said, greetings, rabbi, and he kissed him. But Jesus said to him, friend, why have you come? 
How terrible for Judas not only to betray Jesus, that would be bad enough, but to do it with a kiss, with a warm, affectionate greeting. So no wonder that Jesus said that Judas was guilty of the greater sin. That's what he told Pilate. No wonder that Jesus said that it would have been better if Judas were never born. Look at this in Mark chapter 14, verse 21, where it says, The Son of Man indeed goes just as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had never been born. See what Jesus is explaining there? He's explaining to us that, yes, this is fulfilling God's plan. God's plan of the age is prophesied and carried out through the obedience of our Savior. But it does not relieve the responsibility of Judas in the slightest. You see, nobody should ever think that Judas was this unwilling, totally loyal, faithful man, without a shred of greed in his heart, that God forced to uh, reject Jesus and betray Jesus and do it out of the sake of greed. No. All God had to do was to let Judas do what he wanted to do. And that's why, because of this great wickedness, Judas is the ultimate lost one. Jesus called Judas, look at this one in John chapter 17, verse 12, the son of perdition. Jesus, in his great prayer, says this, While I was with them in the world, I have kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me, I have kept, and none of them is lost except the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. It's an interesting phrase there, the son of perdition. It really kind of has in mind the idea of the ultimate lost one or the ultimate destroyed one. That's Judas. So friends, do you see over and over again, we can say that Judas was no hero. He was the ultimate lost soul. He was a hypocrite. He was a deceiver. He was a thief. And the only motive the Bible mentions for his betrayal of Jesus to the death of Jesus is greed. Judas died as a demon-possessed man, possessed by Satan himself. And I'll say it again. We know of one motive that Judas had according to the Bible. That's greed. Whatever his other motives were, God only knows but whatever the motives of Judas were, they were his motives. God used the wicked work of a willing Satan who used a willing Judas. And God ordained that these things would happen, but he did not prompt Judas to sin. Judas is no hero. All right, let me conclude with this, and then we'll get on to the questions in the side chat. But I do want to say this. It's easy for us to stand across from a distance and to say how terrible Judas is, and it's deserved. <laughs> Judas was terrible. We're not trying to debate that. But it's easy for us to forget how we can sin in a similar way. I'm not saying the exact way, but in a similar way to what Judas did. I, I want to read you two quotes from Charles Spurgeon. To me, they really hit home. Here's the first quote I want to read to you. He says, Yet many have sold Jesus for a less price than Judas received. A smile or a sneer has been sufficient to induce them to betray their Lord. That hits home, doesn't it? Listen, we can stand all day long and condemn Judas, and we should. He's worthy of condemnation. The son of perdition is worthy of condemnation. Jesus said even that it would be better if he was never born. But friends, Judas at least got something for his betrayal of Jesus. Isn't it crazy that there are people today who betray Jesus uh, for even a smaller so-called reward than what Judas received? And one other thing, another quote from Spurgeon here he's talking about the way that Judas betrayed Jesus with a kiss. Final thought here. 
This sign of Judas was typical of the way in which Jesus is generally betrayed. When men intend to undermine the inspiration of the scriptures, how do they begin their books? Why, always with a declaration that they wish to promote the truth of Christ. Christ's name is often slandered by those who make a loud profession of attachment to him and then sin as foully uh, and then sin and then sin foully as the chief of transgressors. Friends, isn't that a remarkable quote from Charles Spurgeon? Telling us simply how it is true, it is often true, that Jesus today is not only betrayed, but he's betrayed with a kiss. He's betrayed by those who claim to have some allegiance to Jesus, some profession of faith towards him. Well, may I say, may it never be so with us. Amen. All right, uh, I want to take the time now and take a look at the questions, or at least some of them, that our moderator, Devin, has forwarded to me. Uh, let's take a look now at the questions coming in on the side chat. And again, let me say, uh, I want to thank our TWR Trans World Radio 360 audience that has come here to uh, take part in our YouTube Live. It's wonderful to have you here among us. So uh, let's take a look here. Uh, Jose asks, was King Saul saved? According to 1 Samuel 28, 19, Samuel told Saul that he and his sons were going to be with him. Your thoughts, please. Um, okay, Jose, I think that Saul was not saved. There's nothing in the life or the testimony of King Saul that leads me to believe that he had any spiritual life, any repentance. Now, it is true what you say. In 1 Samuel chapter 28, when Samuel, in this really bizarre occasion, speaks from the realm of the dead to Saul, giving Saul one last chance to repent, he tells Saul, again, Samuel, speaking from the dead, he tells Saul, you are going to be with me. Now, I don't think that Samuel meant you're going to be with me in heaven. I don't think that Samuel meant you're going to be with me in what the Bible calls, Jesus called it the bosom of Abraham in the Gospel of Luke. I don't think that that's the sense at all. I think the sense is instead that you're going to be with me in the realm of the dead. I hope that makes some sense with you. <laughs> you're going to leave the earthly life as you know it, Saul, and you're going to come over to where I am in the realm of the dead. So um, I would think that Saul was not a saved man, that we will not see him in heaven. Now, I'd be delighted to be wrong. And uh, if I see Saul in heaven then I'll apologize to him for my hasty judgment. But it doesn't seem to me that we have any indication of true spiritual life in Saul whatsoever. But it was true that Saul and his sons, particularly Jonathan, would join Samuel in the realm of the dead by the next day. So thank you for that question, Jose. Let me go on to the next one from Todd asking, was Lot considered a faithful believer? Was he sent providentially to Sodom and Gomorrah to preach repentance? Okay, Todd, very interesting question. Because from what we see of the life of Lot as it's recorded for us in the book of Genesis, there doesn't seem to be anything faithful in Lot. First, Lot is... Uh, making or pitching his tent towards the city of Sodom. Then the next time we see him, he's living in Sodom. <laughs> then the next time he is sitting in the gates of the city, he has a position of influence and leadership in the city of Sodom. Then he's destroyed with the city, or rather his possessions are destroyed. He and his family, notably his daughters, his wife, perished on the way out of Sodom. 
escaped because God intervened out of graciousness to Lot. What I'm just trying to say is this. There's nothing in the Genesis account that would lead us to say that there was anything praiseworthy about Lot's uh, association with the city of Sodom. Then we get the difficulty. It's in Second Peter, isn't it? You know, I'll be very honest with you folks. I've written a commentary on the entire Bible. I think I know the Bible pretty well, but I often get confused just in my mind as to what's in First Peter and what's in Second Peter. So often I say, as Peter writes, it's either in First or Second Peter, where he speaks of righteous Lot and his soul being vexed by the ungodliness in the city of Sodom. When we read those words written by Peter, our eyes kind of get big. Wow. First of all, that Lot is described as righteous because that doesn't stand out to us in the book of Genesis. Nor does it stand out to us that his soul was troubled or disturbed or vexed by the sin that he saw in Sodom. So taking those things and putting them together, Todd, Lot was a believer, no doubt about it a faithful believer, I think it's probably better to look at Lot as a believer who was a real believer, if I could use that phrasing, yet compromised. And he was saved, as Paul would later write in one of his letters to the Corinthians, by the skin of his teeth, but, that that means by the narrowest of margins, but uh, he lost everything in the end, losing his dignity with his daughters. Now, was he sent providentially to Sodom and Gomorrah to preach repentance? Well, everything that happens, happens in some ways by God's providence, in some regard or another, either by what God actively performs or allows. So yes, it was definitely in God's plan that Lot go there and preach repentance, which Peter says that he did, but it's hard to describe him as a faithful believer. Even in his hesitancy to leave Sodom and by the fact that in all his years and given all his influence in the city of Sodom, Lot apparently converted no one in his years there. So I hope that answers that question there for you, Todd. Uh, Thank you for submitting it. Next question comes from Donald, who says, People always say sin is sin. Uh, No sin is greater than the other. So what about Judas's sin? Uh, Matthew chapter 26, verse 24. Well, um, Donald, let me just say, you are putting your finger on something uh, that needs to be talked about from time to time. Look, let, let me be very transparent with you all. We preachers, and I certainly consider myself a preacher, I'm not actively right now the pastor over a congregation. Uh, I have more than 28 years of pastoral ministry over a congregation, but uh, I'm not actively serving as a pastor over a congregation right now. Uh, but, But I do know this, that as a preacher, sometimes we preachers speak imprecisely. We don't speak with precision. And what do I mean by that? I mean simply this. We get a little sloppy theologically in the way that we speak. And it's common for preachers to say, I'm sure that sometime or another, I have said this, though I think it would be a long time because I understand this to be a mistake. But I'm sure at some time or another in my preaching, I've said something like this. All sin is sin. God sees all sin the same. It's not true. Now, all sin is sin in this sense, that any sin is enough to make us guilty before God. A small sin makes us guilty before God and needing of a Savior just as much as a big sin does. So in that narrow sense, all sin is the same. However, To say that all sin is equal is really moral craziness. Friends, um, to brutally murder someone is worse than uh, 
I don't know, giving them a side eye or saying something rude to them. It, it may be a similar heart motivation, but the act and its consequences are different. And Jesus specifically told us this when he spoke of some people being liable, some cities, some individuals, of a greater judgment than others. Let me tell you this. Hell will not be the same experience for everyone. There are people, to use the phrase that Jesus used, who will have a greater condemnation, which, by the way, you have to admit is a chilling phrase. There's condemnation and there's greater condemnation. Now, no one will have it good in hell. We understand that. But some people will have it worse than others. There will be a greater condemnation for those who sin worse. I would say this to somebody who is an absolutely hell-bound sinner. I would say, if you refuse to find salvation in Jesus Christ and put your trust in him, if you refuse to repent of your sin and put your faith in who Jesus is and what he did for us, especially what he did for us at the cross and the empty tomb, if you refuse to do that, then it would still be better for you to sin less in your life. It would mean less judgment in hell for you. Now, again, I want to take pains to say we shouldn't think for a moment that anybody will have it good in hell, but some people will have it worse. So, again, I I just want to make it plain to you here, Donald, that when preachers say that all sin is the same or one sin is as bad as another, they mean that in a very narrow sense. And the narrow sense is this, that any sin makes me guilty before God. And all I need is one sin to make me in need of a Savior. Okay, I hope that answers that. And thank you for that question, because I think it's a very good question. Okay, uh, next question comes from Joanne, who says, Would it be possible to say that Judas was the last pre-resurrection example of what will be the final cause of the fall of mankind, currency? Well, Joanne, you're kind of uh, drawing together a couple threads that I haven't drawn together before. I think you're making reference to how the Bible says in the very last days, there will be a specific economic system imposed upon the world and that that will be tied together with anybody's ability to buy or sell that you'll have to proclaim worship of and allegiance to an antichrist individual and his government, and that'll be characteristic of the very last days. And you're making a connection between that currency, that exchange of goods and materials, with the greed that Judas displayed. I don't know if I see a particular link there, but we do have this concept Uh, having to do in the book of Revelation with what some people call uh, commercial Babylon. Babylon, in a broad scriptural sense, uh, sort of stands for or represents the world. And it is expressed sometimes in a religious or a spiritual sense. There is worldly religion, religion that comes from man and not from God. But then there is also commercial Babylon, There's a commercial aspect to the world. And let's face it, so much of the world today operates under those principles of simply buying and selling and people will perform any kind of sin for the sake of money. Think about that for a moment. There is not a single sin that someone would not commit for the sake of money. You you can think of any sin and you could pay someone to carry out that sin. This is how much people love money. So I think that as we see a general trend of the depravity and the desolation of society, the apostasy in general of modern society, you'll see more and more done for the sake of greed, which is one of the things Paul talks about in the very end times. So thank you for that question there, Joanne. TGN Daily says, What would you say is the difference between Peter's denial 
in Judas's betrayal? Okay, TGN, that's a great question. And let me first of all say that there's a difference in the sin itself. Okay, let, let me describe you what the difference is in the sin itself. The sin itself is different in that while Peter clearly denied Jesus, and this is what Peter was doing, for the sake of self-preservation, Peter refused to stand by Jesus when Jesus was being arrested and tried and beaten and crucified. Uh, Peter said, I don't know the man. I don't know who he is. So do, do you see what I'm saying there? Peter's sin was out of fear and self-preservation, cowardice, really. Peter denied that he knew Jesus. What Judas did was not just to deny Jesus, but he took it much further than Peter. Peter, excuse me, Judas, for the sake of money, actually delivered Jesus to his death, his arrest, his custody, his trial, his beatings, his eventual crucifixion. So you could say that in some ways, Peter's sin was more of a passive error. What he did not do, Peter did not courageously identify himself with Jesus Christ. And what Judas did was an active evil of selling out the Son of God for that price. Now, not only was there a difference in their sin, but there was also a difference in their reaction to their sin. The Bible tells us specifically that Judas was filled with remorse, regret. After he did it, he wished he had never done it, and he took those 30 pieces of silver and he cast them somewhere in the temple or the temple courts, and then he went out and he killed himself. That's what Judas did. He was filled with remorse, regret for what he did. But friends, and I really want to emphasize this for you here at TGN, remorse and regret are not necessarily the same thing as repentance. Repentance is something different. Peter repented of his sin. Just because a person feels sorry for this or feels terrible that they did it or know that it was a wrong thing to do, those things in and of themselves are not repentance. Repentance also includes an active turning away from your sin and a looking to Jesus Christ for forgiveness and restoration. So a very clear difference between the sins that Judas and Peter committed and the response to their sins that they made. Thank you for that question there, TGN. Let me go on to the next one from Rita. It says, Can you please explain about the Old and New Testament of the work of the Holy Spirit? Can the Holy Spirit depart from us as in the Old Testament? Okay, now, Rita, I'm going to answer this question without getting into the issue of uh, what some people call, I don't like to use this terminology, but what some people call once saved, always saved. I'm going to leave that off to the side right now and just say, no, there's a very different giving of the Holy Spirit because of the new covenant, the New Testament. When Jesus, in his death and resurrection and through the completeness of his work, when Jesus instituted the new covenant, all those predicted things regarding the new covenant in the Old Testament uh, were enacted. And one of those was a different way that the Holy Spirit was given to his people. Under the new covenant, the Holy Spirit is given um, widely, broadly to everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord. You see, that was the remarkable thing about the day of Pentecost and what Peter made reference to in Acts chapter 2. What Peter made reference to in Acts chapter 2 was this simple phenomenon that the Holy Spirit was poured out upon everybody, not just a few people, but upon everybody, all believers, I should say, not every individual, but all who believed, all who partook of the new covenant. Under the old covenant, the Holy Spirit was poured out upon certain people for certain reasons, 
and often for certain periods of time, God was raising up a special leader or a special worker to accomplish something. Under the new covenant, the Holy Spirit is given to all believers, is given in greater measure, and is given, I would say, in a permanent way. And I base that on the terminology of being sealed with the Spirit. Now, though the Holy Spirit is given to all believers under the new covenant, it is true that we can walk in the Spirit or not walk in the Spirit. We can choose to either keep in step with the Spirit or not. There's no doubt that every believer has the Holy Spirit, but it may be true that the Holy Spirit doesn't have all of that believer, that the believer isn't surrendered in such a way. Look, and I understand that sometimes that truth is taken in a way that makes things weird, uh, you know, making two different classes of Christians. No, that's never the idea. That's never the intent. But when we see the exhortations of the Apostle Paul, when he exhorts Christians to be filled with the Spirit, to walk in the Spirit, to, I like that phrase from J.I. Packer, to keep in step with the Spirit, that means that not everybody does. And so we should make that what we endeavor to do. So there is a challenge given to the believer under the New Covenant. Hey, uh, yield yourself to the Holy Spirit. Be constantly being filled with the Spirit. But we don't have to worry that the Holy Spirit will be taken away from us as we sometimes see happening in the Old Testament. So I hope that question uh, works for you there, uh, or that answer works for you there, Rita. Okay, now a question from Lupe. Lupe says, I hear some pastors say the sexual and verbal abuse. Okay, Lupe, um, first of all, I would agree with what those some pastors say, that a woman... Uh, maybe specifically you're talking about a wife, but let's just say a woman should not put up with physical abuse. <laughs> Dear women, God has not called you to be the punching bag of a man. Do you know what a punching bag is? It's the thing that the boxer punches and God has not called you to be the punching bag for a man, period. And, and you, you have no obligation to keep yourself in a home where uh, that you, you should separate. You should put distance between you and someone who's being physically abusive to you. Now, Lupa asks, does that apply to sexual and verbal abuse as well? Now, I would say that sexual abuse is a form of physical abuse. And so, yes, that isn't to be tolerated either. I will say this, Lupe, it is a difficult line to draw when we talk about verbal abuse. It would be very easy for me to say, no, uh, nobody should have to stay in a verbally abusive situation. And l l let me be very upfront about something. It is just as possible for a woman to be verbally abusive as a man. So, of course, it's possible and it happens all too often that a husband is verbally abusive to his wife. But let's be honest, a wife, though it is less likely for her to be physically abusive, it certainly can happen. But it can be just as likely that she would be verbally abusive towards her husband. The difficulty with this is how verbal abuse is defined. It is possible to have to narrow a definition of verbal abuse but it's also possible to have too wide of a definition of verbal abuse. These are things that must be determined with wise pastoral analysis and counseling and taking a look at. So the principle is true, but there can be a good deal of difficulty tied up in what the definition is of verbal abuse. I can picture in my mind a situation where someone in a marriage was being verbally abused, I'd say, separate. Do it. You don't have to stay there and endure that. But but I could also picture a situation where somebody takes a fairly mild, unkind comment and decides that it's verbal abuse. 
So again, these are things that must be looked at in truth and to realize that we don't want to make the definition of verbal abuse too narrow, but neither do we want to make it too broad. So I, I hope that's helpful for you there, Lupe. Next question comes from Adonis. Adonis asks, when was Matthew chapter 26, verse 28 fulfilled? Here's what it is in the King James Version. Thank you for giving the quote there. Um, Verily I say to you, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. All right, Adonis, I'll tell you exactly when that was fulfilled. That was fulfilled with the transfiguration, which happened uh, very soon after Jesus spoke those words. I forget it may very well be in the Gospel of Matthew, but in at least one of the Gospels, it chronologically arranges it just like that. Jesus gives this promise that there are some standing there in his midst, of course he's referring to his disciples, who would not die until they saw the Son of Man coming in his kingdom, in the glory of his kingdom. And they saw that in the transfiguration. One of the Gospels, I believe it's Matthew, but I'm doing this off the top of my head. It's certainly Matthew, Mark, or Luke. Although the transfiguration is also included in uh, the Gospel of John. But that was fulfilled when Jesus uh, was transfigured before them, shining in the radiance of his kingdom. And, and that showed him the glory of God as Jesus would appear at his second coming as well. So uh, in at least one of the Gospels, it's very clearly arranged that way to, to show us that that is the fulfillment. And uh, I, I believe, uh, Adonis, that that is exactly when that was fulfilled. Okay, uh, next question comes from Alfredo. Are homosexuals reprobate and thus incapable of being saved because they want nothing to do with God? Uh, Alfredo, I, I, would, I would not phrase it in those terms at all. Now, the sin of homosexuality is a serious sexual sin. Absolutely it is. The Bible speaks of it in both the Old and the New Testaments as such. By the way, every once in a while, you'll get people who say that Jesus was not concerned with homosexuality, that it was of no concern to him, that, you know, he never said anything about it. That's not true. And that's not true in a few ways, but I'll just give you one. Jesus specifically said that he had not come to destroy the law and the prophets, but to fulfill them. And that Jesus affirmed the moral law of the Old Testament. He didn't renounce any of it. Certainly, he fulfilled the ceremonial law, but the moral law, Jesus did not repudiate it. So we would not say that Jesus repudiated or revoked the Old Testament law prohibiting homosexuality any more than we would say that Jesus revoked or repudiated the Old Testament law against adultery or what we might call heterosexual sexual sin. Okay, so what we need to understand here, though, is that, yes, these sins are serious, but... Um, they're not beyond God's ability to save. And if a person, whether they are a sinner in a heterosexual, sexual way, or they are a sinner in a homosexual, sexual way, we understand that these people, anybody, can be saved if they will put their trust in Jesus Christ. Again, this is what it means. It means simply this, to understand that you're a sinner and to realize your need for a savior. You understand you cannot save yourself and you need to look to Jesus, to who he is and what he has done, specifically what he did on the cross and the empty tomb. You need to look at the Jesus that's revealed to you in this Bible, not this Bible particularly, but in the Bible, Old and New Testaments, and put your trust in him 
And the Bible says that all who call upon the name of the Lord, in that sense, they shall be saved. Now, um, what if a person struggles with sin after that? D does that mean, well, forget it. You know, No, not necessarily. If their repentance is real and they carry on the struggle against sin, then they can be confident that God has changed their heart and is changing their actions and their habits of mind and heart and body all along the way. But what we don't do, and we need to be careful with this, and say that if you are a Christian, you won't sin any longer. You won't be in bondage to sin as a person was before. You won't be comfortable in habitual sin. John talks about that in 1 John. But instead, it's much more of a matter that you will understand that you've been changed by God and you will do your best to live out what God has worked in. Now, that principle applies to the person who has struggled with homosexuality as well. They need to recognize it as sin. And they need to say, okay, I don't want to carry on that sinful behavior. I want to see who I am, a new man or a new woman in Jesus Christ, and I want to live that out. And if they stumble along the way, God's forgiveness is there, but they need to be carrying on this process of growing in their Christian life. That includes growing in our holiness, in yielding ourselves to God in every area of our life, including our sexuality. So again, I hope that answers that question there for you, Alfredo. Let me take a question here from Jane. Genesis chapter 6, verse 4 says, The Nephilim were on the earth before and after the flood. How did that happen? Uh, Genesis chapter 6, verse 4 in the King James Version says this, There were giants on the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, and the same became mighty men, which are of old, men of renown. Okay, Jane, I'll be honest with you. This, in my mind, is one of the tougher Bible questions to answer. If God destroyed the earth, oh, excuse me, uh, judged the earth. He didn't destroy the earth. If God judged the earth in Noah's flood and only eight remained and the Nephilim and those associated with them were destroyed in the flood and the human race had a new start, as the Bible indicates that they did, then where did the Nephilim come from after the flood? Now, I'll give you my best explanation of this. I'll be very transparent with you, Jay. Um, I don't know if this is a perfect uh, explanation. I don't think it is. In my mind, this explanation has some problems with it. But to me, it's the preferred explanation, even though it has problems with it. I believe that the Nephilim referred to after the uh, flood were people who were large... You know, human beings, there's certain tribes or ethnic groups that are just larger than others. These were remarkably large people, um, you know, on, on the human scale and standard. But they weren't, if I could say, genetically Nephilim. And they were simply named that way in connection with. Something like this. After the flood when there were people who developed just because of genetics and genetic variability and all the rest, there, there emerged a tribe or a group of people who were large and big and strong. People said, man, they're like the Nephilim of old. Now, th th they mean that sort of as a title, not literally so. Just in the same way that if the flood was, as the Bible described, a global catastrophe, surely the rivers that existed before the flood were not the same rivers that existed after the flood, yet there are rivers of the same name. Before the flood, you have the Tigris, you have the Euphrates, and after the flood, you have the same thing. Now, this would just be a description of saying, oh yeah, remember that, that river? It looks just like the Tigris that was before the flood. That looks just like the Euphrates. Now, Jane, I I'm going to be honest with you. 
Uh, I'm not entirely satisfied with that explanation, but in my mind, it's the best explanation that I could come up with. Um, I'm sure other people have some uh, their own ideas, but that's the best one that I could come up, um, up with. Okay, uh, another question comes from Jordan. Uh, Jordan asks, any advice for overcoming laziness and procrastination? All right, Jordan, I'll give you just very practical advice. And first of all, let me say, God bless you for asking this question. Uh, I have a verse-by-verse -verse commentary on the entire Bible. You can find it at EnduringWord.com. And the last book of the Bible that I wrote commentary on was Proverbs. And one of the things that's remarkable about Proverbs is how it speaks of laziness. The book of Proverbs, God's Word, takes laziness as a real sin, as a serious sin. Okay, so what do we say about laziness then? Well, I'll give you two very practical ways to deal with it. Number one, make lists for yourself. At the end of every day, make a list of things that you need to accomplish tomorrow and look at the list in the morning and set out yourself to accomplish those things. Much of our laziness and procrastination is because we just don't make lists. We're not methodical in thinking, okay, I got to do this. I got to do this. I got to do this. Make lists for yourself. That's one thing to do. Second thing you do, uh, make yourself accountable to somebody. Look, in anything that we're trying to overcome, if we have somebody to whom we will be accountable, it is remarkable to see how things will change in our life. So I would simply give you that recommendation. Make yourself accountable to somebody. Uh, first, start making lists of what you need to do each day and make it at the end of the day and start with it in the next day. And then secondly, make yourself accountable to somebody. And then for our final question for today comes from Paige. Paige writes, Were Peter, James, and John in Jesus's inner circle because they were the first to be called by him. Well, Paige, you're asking a great question. I'm looking here on my bookshelf to see if I have a particular book that I want to show you. Uh, okay, Paige, there are people who have suggested that. Uh, maybe it's because they were the first one called. I don't know, because uh, Andrew was called at the same time as Peter. Matter of fact, Andrew was called before Peter, and he's not always in that. Sometimes he's included as four, Peter, James, John, and Andrew. Uh, but other times it's just Peter, James, and John. So I, I don't think that the order of calling uh, really holds water. Okay, so I'm, I'm not so convinced of that. There are other people think, uh, who think that Peter, James, and John formed an inner circle of Jesus' disciples because they were Jesus' favorites. Jesus kind of picked favorites, and he said, uh, hey, you know, I'm going to pick these guys. Peter, James, no, you guys are my favorites. I'll spend more time with you than any of the others. I'm going to suggest a third alternative that I first heard from a man named Gail Irwin. Gail has an amazing book. Folks, if you haven't read this book, get this book, The Jesus Style. I'm showing you an old hardcover edition of the book, but you can get it in paperback very easily. Uh, just uh, search for it, Gail Irwin. Irwin with an E, and the book is The Jesus Style. I'll include the book name and the author's name in the uh, program notes. But here, what Gail Irwin suggested was he said, no, the reason why uh, God, Jesus specially chose Peter, James, and John was because they were likely to cause the most trouble and he needed to keep a close eye on them. It's kind of like the teacher who looks over the class and uh, most of the children are well-behaved, but there's those three kids, Peter, James, and John. Hey, you three, you stick close by me. I got to keep a special eye on you. I have to say, of all the suggestions I've heard as to why Jesus would have selected Peter, James, and John, I find that to be the best explanation of all. So um, I hope you got that. And I, I want to thank you, Paige, for that question. I want to thank everybody who's tuned in today especially our TWR, Transworld Radio 360 audience. 
uh, again, thank you for joining me. And uh, if you want to learn more about the Bible, uh, maybe just in your daily reading, perhaps when you have a Bible question, uh, maybe you've been asked to teach or lead a discussion having to do with Bible. Maybe you're part of a Bible study fellowship or precepts class. Again, check out my Bible commentary at EnduringWord.com. Maybe you'll find it helpful. <laughs> of course, not everybody finds it helpful. That's just how it is. But maybe you would. And if you would, I'd be very pleased. So uh, go right ahead, EnduringWord.com. And I don't mind asking you as well, pray for the ongoing work of Enduring Word. Our heart is to get these Bible resources out to as broad an audience as we can, absolutely free, no ads, no paywall, no VIP section, and to do it as in many languages as we can. Hey, just today I learned that our Chinese commentary on the New Testament is now on the biggest Chinese language Bible app we devote. And we are thrilled that the Bible commentary is available in Chinese and Arabic on the site we devote and the app. So please keep praying that God helps us to get these free Bible resources in English and in translation all over the world. God bless you. Thank you for joining me today. And uh, we hope to join you next week as well. God bless you. Have a wonderful day.